So we'll just wait while people come and join us, and we'll start in about 10 or 15 seconds from now. So good evening, everyone, and welcome to the latest of our Selwyn webinars. And we're thrilled again tonight to have a huge audience, around 400 people, uh, because it is our star guest tonight, Robert Harris, who is an alumnus, an honorary fellow, and of course, uh, a very distinguished author. So we're going to be talking mainly about his book, Munich, um, and then about the movie, which uh, we set as homework for some people, uh, Munich, The Edge of War, which is currently running on Netflix. And I'm going to interview Robert about the process of the book and the film, and then talk uh, a little bit more about Chamberlain and the historical context. And at any point, you're very welcome to put in a question via chat, and uh, we will pick up the questions. So I'll talk to Robert for maybe 15 or 20 minutes, and then the rest of the session up until about 5 to 7 or 7 o'clock will be your questions. So um, I hope you have uh, an enjoyable hour with us. Um, and first, in saying good evening to um, Robert, um, I want to express my views on those, I think, of the whole college community and our alumni community about what's happening in Ukraine. And our thoughts tonight are very much with the people of Ukraine. And Robert, in, in saying that, um, there is a link, obviously, between Ukraine and Munich. We heard only a week or so ago the British Defence Secretary talking about the whiff of Munich and what was happening at that time in Ukraine. Um, and of course, we now have a terrible war happening. Yes. Uh, well, good evening, Roger, and hello, hello everyone out there. Uh, yeah, no, it's appalling. I think we've all watched the scenes this week with great distress, uh, and it isn't uh, the sort of thing we've seen in Europe, as people have said, since uh, 1945, um, and uh, there are obvious parallels uh, with Germany in the 30s, um, a defeated giant, uh, humiliated, one by the end of the Cold War, the other by obviously the Versailles Treaty and the loss of the First World War. Uh, millions of ethnic uh, members of the country out, left outside the borders, which had been with, redrawn in a way they're not happy with. Um, and, and, a, and a dictator in charge uh, who dreams of restoring uh, the empire. Um, and so th the parallels are very stark. I felt it with uh, Crimea uh, when uh, that area was taken by Putin. And of course, one feels it even more now. And uh, of course, our hearts go out to uh, the people there and the way that they've been trapped by this. It was quite amusing. I saw the headline of Ben Wallace saying that he had smelt the whiff of Munich in the air, it was in a Sunday Times story. And when you read down to the eighth paragraph, you found that he'd just authorized all British forces to withdraw from the Ukraine, uh, who had been helping the Ukrainians uh, learn anti-tank warfare. So I thought that this, uh, if there was a whiff of Munich, it seemed to me to be emanating from the British Defence Ministry. Well, we, we may come back to that later, uh, Robert, in the questions and answers, but let's talk about um, the book and Munich based on real events. And it's a familiar theme for an author about what is fact and what is fiction. And of course, you start from something which was a major historical event. How do you decide how much of the fact to keep and how much you're going to introduce, for instance, your two lead characters are completely fictitious? Yeah, well, there is a lot of fact in the book. I mean, basically, I began it by um, assembling a kind of chronology of events from uh, May uh, 1938, which is when the Czechoslovak crisis really started to build up right the way through uh, till the end of September. Um, and into that framework of fact and real people, um, I started to um, spoon in um, the invented characters. I mean, I did toy at one point point with the idea of making Chamberlain the, the central character, perhaps writing a memoir just before his death. He died out of office um, in the uh, winter of 1940, but it seemed to me too dry really to do that. And I needed, uh, I, I had for many years the idea of writing a novel about a, a private secretary who flew, with Munich, uh, flew to Munich with Chamberlain on the plane, who was facing a kind of crisis in his own private life, which would somehow be mirrored uh, by the international crisis. 
but I, it didn't quite work as a novel. And then I realized, I read a bit more as the years went on. This was in the back of my mind for 30 years or more, this novel. And I read about uh, Hitler and his reaction to Munich. And I saw that if one wanted to take a slightly different view of Munich, then the person you really would need to be with was Hitler as well, because um, it was he who was so enraged by the deal he was forced to make at Munich. So I wanted to show that. So then came the idea of having these two characters, one English, one German, who'd been at Oxford, the German being a Rhodes Scholar, when they were restarted after the First World War uh, at the beginning of the 1930s, uh, and, tr and tracing their, their trajectory as each with one of the leaders heads towards Munich. So there's a great framework of fact, uh, which is uh, the, which is the ess essential structure of the novel. And in, then into that, I put these two fictional characters. But one of the really central parts of the book and the movie is the Hossback Memorandum, which is the memorandum in which it appears that Hitler's ambitions for territorial conquest and expansion are revealed. And, and of course, in the book and the movie, um, Chamberlain sees that and becomes aware of it. In, in real life, he didn't. So that's quite a big change. Yeah, no, I think that that's fair. I mean, what I my rule with all the historic no, historical novels that I've written is to um, is to never put anything that, that I know for certain didn't happen. And you might say, well, it's certain that Chamberlain never saw the Hossback Memorandum or knew anything about it. But actually, um, it's I think it's legitimate conjecture uh, to suggest he might have done. Um, it's, it's within the, it seems to me, the spirit of historical fiction, which is, I mean, it is a novel manifestly, you, you, you know that. Um, so it, it, it seemed to me that, uh, it was worth doing that. One of the things about Munich, which most people get confused about, is they think that both the, the, the agreement for the return of the, or, or the handing over the Sudeten German territory to Germany uh, was the same as the piece of paper that was waved at the aerodrome when Chamberlain returned the next day. The two are actually completely separate. The, the, the Munich agreement was signed about in the early hours of the morning uh, of the 30th of September. And um, at that signing, Chamberlain asked if he could come and see uh, Hitler the following morning, which Hitler really didn't have any option but to agree. And so Chamberlain went to his apartment. Um, something happened. He, he didn't tell the British officials he was going to do this, and they reacted with horror when they learned about it the next morning, the Foreign Office officials. So something happened. I th seems to have happened, gone off in Chamberlain's mind, and it seemed to me that the idea that these two young men got to him uh, and, and, and gave him impetus to do something different uh, and to go and see Hitler, that seemed to me to be, you know, part of the tools of the trade of historical fiction. I don't know if you saw the movie um, Finest Hour, um, which um, shows a scene in which Churchill gets on a tube train <laughs> and really decides to fight a war because everyone on the tube encourages him, which I, I personally found a bit toe curling. And I, I, just, I just wonder whether there are cases like that where you're illustrating a wider historical truth, so it's OK, or are there things that you absolutely wouldn't do because you just wouldn't think you could get into that kind of speculative mode? Well, the, the, that scene, I agree with you. I would not have done that because, well, first of all, Churchill never went on the tube. I think he went on once on the circle line and didn't know how to get off. Uh, and he just kept going round and round, his wife said. So they had to send the, the valet down to intercept him at uh, one of the circle line. <laughs> stations and rescue them. So it's implausible in the first place. But it, putting that aside, I mean, you could get away with it. But the crucial thing is, I think if, you, in, if you're inventing something, you want it to um, capture the spirit of the occasion even better, if you like, than, than the historical fact. The historical fact about Churchill in the summer of 1940 is that nobody else really knew what to do the British people in particular, actually, they didn't know what was going to happen. And Churchill told them what they were going to do and what was going to happen. And that's why he is a supreme 
uh, leader, an example of leadership, because he just said, listen, this is the case and this is what I should, we are going to do. And everybody responded to it. It's the very opposite of what that scene seemed to suggest. He wasn't going to a focus group, you know, and kind of trying to work out and get their ideas. The, the reverse was the case. But, you know, you know, I think there's such a pleasure in historical fiction and, and films that you have to just overlook um, the, the the changes that have to be made. Um, you know, I have a sort of saying to myself when I'm writing a novel, uh, you know, uh, if it's very authentic, it's unreadable. And if it's too readable, it's not authentic. And you somehow have to, uh, this is particularly true of Roman novels, I think, you somehow have to walk that tightrope. How much did it matter to you that there is a German director and that some of the dialogue for the Germans is in German and it's obviously English in English, but does that add to the authenticity? And were you, did you actively seek out or did the movie company seek out a, a German director for those reasons? Yes, it was always envisaged that it would be an Anglo-German uh, production. First of all, it was going to be done by Euston Films and Ufa Cinema in Berlin, who are both owned by the Bertelsmann Group, um, my, who own my publishers. And then that fell through and Netflix picked it up, but with the same idea. They wanted to make, uh, they want to expand their reach into, into foreign language territories. And they are looking to make this sort of production that is bo in both languages. And I thought it was a brilliant idea. And it was always, even in the Houston Films version, it was going to have a German, German director and a, and a British writer. Uh, and be filmed half in one country and half in the other. And that works particularly well, I think, uh, because you get both sensibilities. You get uh, uh, the German scenes and the German acting is particularly fine in Munich, I think. Uh, there, it's a first-rate uh, cast and a real sense of authenticity. Um, and I think that was very important. And on the writing of the book and then the film, there are quite large chunks of book dialogue that go into the movie. So when you're writing the book, are you thinking about it ever as a movie when you're giving characters their dialogue? No, not at all. I, I know that people think this is, you know, would be odd. I mean, you know, you, you'd, you'd always... I mean, one always hopes that things would get bought and get turned into films or TV productions because they, they reach a, a much larger... Uh, audience and it helps the book um, but I, I don't uh, consciously uh, write uh, with a, with a sale in mind uh, and the dialogue won't just uh, you know I write for the reader of the book and I try and make it as sort of interesting and hopefully authentic and credible as possible and that it, it advances the story um, and quite often if someone if, if a company has bought the book um, the writer who, who adapts it will will keep the things that they like. Uh, in in Munich, there was quite a lot of change, but there are two scenes which are very lifted, really straight out of the novel. One is Chamberlain in the garden of Ten Downing Street, talking about why he wants peace, uh, which I think is crucial. And the other is the central scene, really, of the whole film, which is in his hotel room in Munich when his private secretary brings his German friend to meet him. Uh, and, and those scenes, uh, um, the dialogue is pretty well all mine. So I was going to ask you, you've got the pesky film writers adapting and changing some of your lovely words. But also you just mentioned um, Jeremy Irons, who I think does an outstanding performance as Chamberlain. It truly is um, wonderful. But here's what Jeremy Irons said in, va in um, I was going to say varsity. It's actually <laughs> variety, which is more um, for showbiz. Um, Not uh, nearly as influential. Irons that's right yeah he said i fought for an extended version of a scene in the downing street garden where we see chamberlain's gut horror at going to war so my question to you would be did he oh yes he did i mean my main contribution to this uh, film uh i didn't do the screenplay uh and it, i didn't really i didn't talk to the screenwriter actually uh, but my main contribution was that uh, I, I knew Jeremy uh, Irons of old, who was a friend, and, and I'd met him to discuss 
and playing a stage part in, in another novel of mine, adaptation of uh, Conclave. And I was just finishing Munich and I sat across from him at the lunch table. Nothing happened to the Conclave thing. And uh, I thought, my God, he, look, he looks so like Neville Chamberlain. In, I mean, a very handsome version of it, but the same sort of cast of features. And I, I said, I'm writing this book about uh, Munich. Would, might you be interested in playing Chamberlain? And he said, well, I, you know, I can't commit to that, but send me the book. So the moment I'd finished the book, I sent it to him. And uh, 10 days later, he sent me an email saying, this is right up my street. I'd be very happy to do it. And miraculously, because these things seldom work out, he stayed right the way through uh, until, the, um, until the film was made, which took about four years in all. Uh, and uh, he was very actively involved because he'd been attracted by the novel in the first place. And he had a very strong conception of how he wanted to play Chamberlain. And um, Netflix took the view with the movie, and I think quite rightly, that to appeal to a wide audience, they had to focus on the young people, the, the two young men and the girl who is the girlfriend of the German character. And... Uh, they had to be in the foreground. And so the early drafts of the screenplay cut out quite a lot of Chamberlain. And he was, very, he was more of a peripheral figure. And Jeremy and, and, me, and me as well, we fought to, uh, to, um, to get him back in the film as much as possible. And I think, and certainly Jeremy was very influential in that. And I agree with you. He's the totemic figure in this film. Uh, he is the one whose picture illustrates all the articles about it. Uh, you know, I, I think it's been incredibly important, his, 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 his part in the film. And although, obviously, I mean, Chamberlain was a sm small, slight figure, shy, um, uh, you know, difficult to get to know, whereas Jeremy obviously is an imposing, handsome movie star. But nevertheless... By, by having Chamberlain played by such a person, one finally got away from this kind of, you know, weak, doddery old fool that he's always portrayed as, and particularly you mentioned uh, in Darkest Hour. And we at least get a feeling of the most dominant politician of the 1930s in many ways, a man who was Chancellor of the Exchequer, uh, who, who was Minister of Health and then became Prime Minister, who was dominant, strong, feared within his own party, uh, and was the very opposite of the, of the weak and helpless old gentleman that he's often portrayed as. We're getting some um, very good questions, including from people who've written about this or had relatives involved. So I'll come to those in um, five or six minutes. But I would just like to pursue a bit more the Chamberlain argument. And um, you've been accused, um, I don't know if you like the word or not, of being a bit revisionist on Chamberlain. So what you just said about um, the image now versus the powerful politician of the 30s. Um, and actually, maybe reflecting that, um, Depressor in Austria um, said that the consequence of the movie was that British cinema has now been bathed in glory for what was actually a, hero a less than heroic, slightly embarrassing eve of the war. And what you now have is Rue Britannia, at least on the big screen. Do you think Depressor was fair? Uh, no, <laughs> I don't really. I mean, it's true that the film goes a bit further than the novel. There's a caption at the end which says something like, um, thanks to the time bought by the Munich Agreement, Britain has, was able to rearm and win the war. Um, and there's some truth in that, but um, I wouldn't put it quite as starkly. Uh, what would be true to say is that to the end of his life, Adolf Hitler thought that signing the Munich Agreement was the greatest mistake he ever made and that he wished he'd gone to war in 1938 and believed that if he had done so, he would have won. And that is incontestably true. Um, so it, the film is, you know, they, I think to a degree that Netflix wanted to cause a controversy and why not? I mean, it's a debate. Uh, my God, we've heard the other side endlessly in books and films and TV shows. You know, why not? Let's just look at why Chamberlain was overwhelmingly popular throughout the world in September 1938, regarded as a savior of peace. Uh, and, and, and continued on into the war as uh, the, the prime minister. Uh, I, I think that, you know, the thing you have to remember about Munich is that Hitler did want to fight. 
And he was frustrated in that ambition because Chamberlain went to see him and Hitler was almost so taken aback when Chamberlain asked what was the reason why there was going to be a war that he actually outlined the pretext for war. If you like the Putin line as to, uh, you know, that the, uh, the oppression of the minority and so on. And Chamberlain said, we can sort that out. You don't want to go to war over that. We can, we can work this out. Uh, and, and that was what he uh, proceeded to do. Now uh, he came back uh, and he waved the piece of paper. He was overwhelmed, I think, by the reception that he received. Thousands of people outside Buckingham Palace. The car crawled through the traffic to get him back from the aerodrome. He went onto the balcony. It was like a royal wedding. As far as you could see up the mile, the people were waving and cheering. And when he got back to Downing Street, his wife said, say that thing about that Disraeli said about coming back with peace and with honour and peace for our time. And someone lifted the window of Downing Street and he leaned out and, and he said it. And he withdrew and he turned to Alec Douglas Hume, who I, his private sec, principal parliamentary private secretary, who I met and interviewed about Chamberlain. And he said to him, that was a mistake. And um, the, on, that was on the Friday night. And on the Monday in the, in the House of Parliament, he apologised for making that remark. He said, I was tired. It was a long day. And the truth is that in the next year, under Chamberlain, Britain spent half of all tax revenue on rearmament and built the aircraft factories, which meant that by the summer of 1940, we were producing more fighters than the Germans and built the Spitfires, built the radar, all the familiar arguments. Um, so it's a complex story. He was wrong and he was naive, I think. And I think he did trust Hitler, but he also got that piece of paper, according to Hume, um, because he said, if he doesn't keep this, the whole world will see it. And it may even bring the Americans in. That is what Hume said that he said to him. And so Chamberlain said, I'm going to make a big thing of it when I get back to uh, London, which he did. And of course, He's uh, ruined forever by the image of him reading out that uh, document. But I think that we would have been in a much weaker position if he hadn't done that. I think that it gave us the time to rearm. It gave us the moral authority to and belief to fight the war through when it looked like we would lose it in the summer of 1940. And a crucial voice in uh, what the war cabinet of, for fighting on was Neville Chamberlain, because he said, I've done a deal with Hitler before and he won't keep to it. So whatever he may offer us now, he'll come back in a year's time. I want something different. So I, I think that we needed Chamberlain uh, in almost as much as we needed Churchill uh, in, in order to uh, fight the war through with the tools we needed um, to win it. So uh, that's the sort of case for him. Of course, he's not as compelling a figure as Churchill. And he, in the end, he was wrong. And he said, everything I believed in has crashed in ruins. Um, but I think he became a very convenient scapegoat in the summer of 1940, when the Labour Party, Michael Foote, and the left combined with the Churchillian right to make him, and the Conservative Party really, to make him the scapegoat for everything that had gone wrong. Sorry, that's a long answer, but that really is the case in a nutshell. No, it's a, it's a fascinating answer. And I think the central accusation you mentioned there, which is that he did appear to trust Hitler, and he wrote, I think, to his sister saying that he trusted Hitler. But to, to just give the fuller version of the quote you mentioned, and what he said um, towards the end of his life, and of course he died, I think, in what, 1940, 1941? November 1940, yeah. 1940. Um, um, the, the actual quote, which I think he said in 1939, was everything that I've worked for, everything that I've hoped for, everything that I've believed in during my public life has crashed into ruins, which is why he's seen now as a, as a study in failure. Yes, well, you know, appeasement failed. It was worth a try, probably, and I'm not at all convinced um, there was much alternative. I mean, you know, appeasement is a, now a filthy word, but appeasement really is quite a sensible policy. Uh, for, for nations to pursue. Uh, to take one example, uh, the settling of the Irish peace process under Major and Blair was really appeasement. It was taking uh, people who were regarded as almost psychopathic criminals uh, who tried to assassinate the British government and killed thousands, hundreds of people, thousands, I think, uh, and uh, nevertheless swallow the repugnance 
try to find the historic causes of the disagreement and meet them. Uh, it was an act of appeasement that worked and, and there were Nobel Prizes handed out and everyone was very pleased with it, quite rightly. It was probably worth a try in 1938, even with Adolf Hitler, also, uh, as we now know, a psychopath and a killer, and uh, just to try and avoid a war that eventually killed 60 million people. And uh, Chamberlain says, and I, this is a direct quote from him, which I put as dialogue and which survives in the movie. He said, I think it was in a letter to one of his sisters, I believe the country would suffer a spiritual breakdown 20 years after the end of the First World War, if the people didn't see their leaders trying to do everything possible to avoid another conflict. Uh, that was his sincere belief. I mean, he was as messianic for peace as, as Hitler was for war, and as blinded in many ways, and as egocentric, and as stubborn. Um, uh, and and he, got, he got Hitler dead wrong, but um, so did um, the vast majority of people, actually. Uh, Robert, we, we've, we've got some great questions coming, so let me start putting those to you. Um, first from Charles Spicer, who says, while there is no evidence of Chamberlain seeing the Hossback Memorandum, as you said, he had been made aware of its broad themes very energetically by Group Captain M.G. Christie, MC, DSO, CMG, who befriended Goering and fed back the key intelligence through Robert Vanissart. My book on Christie, he says, and his colleagues, Coffee with Hitler comes out in September, shameless plug. <laughs> well, good luck with it, Mr. Spicer. I don't blame you at all. Uh, and that's fascinating. And of course, you know, the broad, I mean, what, what the Hossback Memorandum sets out, which for those who don't know it, was a meeting in, in November 1937, uh, uh, attended by very few people, the, 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 the uh, Goering, uh, the commanders of the three armed forces, uh, the foreign minister, uh, and uh, anyone, incidentally, who was there who was less than enthusiastic about Hitler's plan was uh, was fired uh, in the months that followed. For instance, Ribbentrop became the foreign minister. And what Hitler did was he outlined, he said, you know, the problem with Germany is we don't have enough space for 80 million people. We're going to have to expand and create an empire. And he, he literally laid it all out. But all this he laid out actually in Mein Kampf, uh, uh, before, so you know, it was all available there to read. Um, but the 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 memorandum is fascinating. Was highly classified. There were just a few uh, copies, and I thought they would be marvelous if, um, uh, if 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 my German resistance man, which is the German character in the novel, gets hold of it, uh, and the German resistance want to get it to Hitler and uh, to to Chamberlain. I mean, that is a sort of plausible. I don't think that's completely implausible, actually. Um, a question which may be a bit outside the time frame, but Parvasha von Hassel, um, who says, Hi, Robert, I greatly enjoyed your book some years ago and just recently this excellent film. Um, she's moving on to 1941, and she just wondered if during your research you came across Ulrich von Hassel, then the German ambassador in Rome from our family, from her family, who was part of the resistance, tried in vain to get Britain to help overthrow Hitler, um, the Valkyrie um, project. And that's um, from Parfasha von Hassel. Yes, of course, I did come across him. And um, one does come across the uh, descendants of these um, heroic figures. Um, the literary editor of the Financial Times, who interviewed me a while ago, his uh, grandfather was uh, the Schoenberg, who was the ambassador in uh, Moscow at the time of the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact, and who was, I think, executed uh, in 1944. Um, you know, this is a controversial thing because uh, there is a school of thought which says that one of the ch charges against, this is particularly made by Paddy Ashdown, oddly enough, one of the charges against uh, Chamberlain is that he didn't take the German resistance um, seriously enough uh, and that they might have been able to topple Hitler if Britain and France had declared war in 1938. I took that very seriously 
But Bali is a thriller writer, actually. I wanted it to be true. I wanted it to, to feel that, you know, that this might have happened. But I, it seems to me extremely implausible. And in fact, the, the von Brauschitz, the commander of the, the German armed forces and the only man who really could have issued an order for the army to move against Hitler, he dismissed the whole notion after the war when he was in a British prisoner of war camp when it would have suited him to uh, portray himself as a member of the resistance. He said it was a, the whole thing was ludicrous. It was very small nucleus of uh, opposition, a lot of it in the German Foreign Office in 1938. Uh, and the, the, the truth is, it wasn't until July 1944, when anyone could see that the war was lost, uh, that the German army really moved against Hitler. Uh, and, you know, by then, it, by then it was too late. Um, but I mean, that, that's to take nothing away from the bravery of the people that um, try to do it. And, and one of the things I found most horrifying in doing the research, because, you know, I had to touch on this, is... is is what happened to them, the, gru the gruesome treatment and executions they suffered um, it, it is, is, is still horrific to read. As, as well as Selwyn alumni with um, um, incredible family connections, we also have some pretty smart historians, of course, from Selwyn. So this is a, um, a history viber question for you from Andy Lake. Um, the question about the history says, and in particular, on giving us time to rearm. Did you get a sense that Chamberlain gave much consideration to the impacts on evolving Soviet policy and their expansionist ambitions? Arguably, says Andy, there's a line connecting Munich and the Nazi-Soviet pact because Stalin increasingly felt no deal was possible with the Western powers and they were edging Germany eastwards to save themselves. In that sense, Munich may have contributed to hastening the onset of World War II with the division of Poland agreed by Stalin. Well, there's obviously there's, there's truth in that. Um, I mean, you know, whenever, when everyone's discussing Munich, in the end, you end up saying hindsight's a wonderful thing. You know, um, if we knew um, then what we know now, everyone would have done things differently. There were a lot of problems with doing a deal with Hitler. First of all, of course, the Conservative Party was over, not least Churchill, was overwhelmingly hostile to the Russian Revolution. Uh, uh, and of, of course, uh, Stalin was exporting uh, subversion uh, and uh, through uh, Comintern. And, uh, and also Stalin had killed many, many millions of people by 1938. There had been the show trials in Moscow, the purges of the Red Army, uh, but also, of course, the famine in Ukraine. Uh, and, and, and the treatment of the Kulaks. So for a statesman sitting in London, Stalin seemed a much more dangerous person and the Bolshevik ideology much more threatening to the British Empire, actually, than the Nazis did at that point. But bear in mind, they hadn't actually been crystal knacked at that point, which only occurred uh, about two months after uh, the Munich Agreement. And also there's a question of looking at the map. I mean, with countries like Poland, uh, Hungary, Czechoslovakia, they did not want uh, to give the passage to the Red Army, which would have been the only feasible way in which in which uh, they could have brought pressure to bear on Hitler. Uh, to, to They would have had to cross territory of countries which, with some reason, we now know through hindsight, they were right to be very suspicious of uh, Stalin. So yes, of course, now we can see uh, the wisdom of it, but uh, at the time, I think you know uh, it was uh, it was tricky, and we did need the time to rearm. I mean, and another p p point that may be made by someone is that the Germans uh, also increased had rearmed during that year and produced more tanks and more planes than we did. But we started from such a low base, a couple of dozen Spitfires. Uh, that even if the Germans did make more, the crucial difference was that by the by the, the summer of 1940 or by the outbreak of war, the Air Force was 10 times the size. Uh, so, you know, the, the, it was so important for us to actually gain the weaponry uh, to, to hold on in the summer of 1940, when we were really, as someone, as several people have written, historians have written, we were a military superpower in the summer of 1940. The idea that we were some feeble, beaten down, hopeless dad's army wreck we had the most powerful navy in the world. We were had the most sophisticated fighter, and we were outproducing the Germans. What we lacked was an army. Um, 
we've got about 20 minutes left so please keep the questions um coming um, because they tend to all come in as surge at the end so um, a bit of spacing out would be fantastic and question from owen trailer back now to more robert the mechanics of making the movie and owen says robert clearly did considerable research about the workings of the civil service Downing Street, Foreign Office, etc. in 1938. Did screenwriter Tony Kushner do his own research on this or did he rely on you? Oh, well, I think I did all the research without blowing my own trumpet. I don't think um, anyone went off and did any more uh, anything. And I did do a lot of research. I was incredibly... Well, first of all, it's, it was a joy to me because I've always been fascinated by the period. And uh, so, but I did... Uh, I got great help from the Foreign Office official historian, Patrick Salmon, who uh, showed me where Cadogan's office, the permanent sec undersecretary of the Foreign Office, I, I sat there. I hadn't realised he could be in, in the cabinet room of number 10 within 90 seconds. He just looked across Downing Street and the Foreign Secretary's room. Uh, and I got the foreign office lists of who, 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 you know, passed top that year in the exam to get into the foreign office. I saw the, the papers that you had to take when you were at, uh, inevitably Oxford or Cambridge to try and get into the, or Bailey already, <laughs> to get into the foreign office. Uh, and, uh, and, and I was shown around by M Theresa May, who was then prime minister, by her political secretary, uh, uh, who showed me, allowed me to wander around and see where Chamberlain's office was and uh, the uh, uh, where Horace Wilson's office was. And in Germany, I was able to go not only to the Führerbau, where they actually filmed scenes in the movie where the conference took place in central Munich, but also to Hitler's apartment, which is almost never allowed anyone outside to go in and see that, not least because it's so unchanged and so uh, such a haunting place. So I did do a lot of research. It's been an obsession of mine, Munich, for 30 or 40 years. So, I, you know, I, I had all the books and uh, it was just a matter of finding the characters to, to make the novel work. Uh, we're going to more general questions about writing and novels and one which um, I hope you don't mind keeping it in the family from Oliver Wickham. A question more on the fiction side of things. Does Robert read the novels of his brother-in-law, Nick Hornby? And if so, <laughs> has Nick's writing been an influence at all? I do read them, of course, as a loyal brother-in-law, but I wouldn't, I would think we often laugh about it. It would hard to be hard to find two writers less alike uh, in, in subject matter um, and in everything else than the two of us. Uh, uh, he has no interest in Nazis. I have no interest in football. Um, so <laughs> uh, I wouldn't say that either of us has influenced the other. Uh, so no, it's been a, a weird coincidence that we both started publishing. He published Fever Pitch and I published Fatherland in 1992. And we've gone on sort of a parallel careers ever since. A home team question from uh, Mike Nicholson, uh, who says, are there any film adaptations of other writers, historical novels that you especially admire? Oh, no, that's a very tricky one. Um, a, a, almost my favourite film, which I watch every couple of years, and I watched about 10 days ago, is Master and Commander of the Patrick O'Brien novels. I think it's two novels they've made into the one film. I think that's a superlative uh, uh, movie. Um, so authentic, brilliantly structured and written and acted. Um, if anyone hasn't seen it, I cannot recommend it too highly. I'm, I'm full of envy for that, which I think is, uh, I think is marvellous. Um, so that, so that uh, in particular, I would recommend. OK, um, I'm just going to add a couple of comments and then go to a question, actually, which goes takes us back to Ukraine. But one comment from Michael Boyce, who is SE 1946, who says, uh, not a question, but a comment. I was 12 when war broke out, and I recall all the worries the adults had as evacuations began in September 1938 and again in August 1939. So uh, I think Michael, obviously, one of our older alumni joining us tonight. And just now bringing... Um, the trauma of war up to date. But a question from 
Bob Price, um, who says, does the experience of Munich and what ensued suggest in the case we're looking at now in Ukraine that NATO should have intervened militarily when it became clear that Putin was planning the invasion? So in other words, should, have, should we have had a more active policy? Well, you know, that's, that is the, the massive question. Um, I mean, personally, um, I, I don't think that it would have been wise for, the, for Ukraine to be part of NATO. And uh, if you think there was a whiff of Munich in the air <laughs> uh, 10 days ago, um, believe me, the, the prospect of a world war with, with civil defence exercises in London and across Britain as we prepare for the possibility of a nuclear strike, um, the army being sent there, the closing and evacuation of schools, all the things that happened in 1938, but happening now with cruise missiles and that threat. I mean, you know, who, people, of course people want to avoid a war. And, um, you know, I, I, I completely go along with that actually. Um, you know, the fact of the matter is we very carefully avoided making any commitment that would mean that British or American or NATO boots would be on the ground. Different with the Baltic states. Now, let's see then what happens if Putin does start to um, create excuses to attack uh, Estonia, Latvia and Lithuania, because then we will be treaty bound uh, to go to their defense. Um, and then the Munich parallels will become extremely strong because uh, that would be a shooting war. Uh, and I suspect that if a British prime minister was to somehow get Putin or whoever and Biden around the table and briefly at least prevent a war, they too would be hailed as a hero uh, on their return. I wouldn't be at all surprised. Um, absolutely following on Karen Moreland, who says, do you think Chamberlain would have learned from his experience in today's situation? I think he was an apostle for peace. I, he absolutely loathed war. Um, and in many ways, his predictions about the war were better and more accurate than Churchill's. He, he'd First of all, he thought the French wouldn't fight if it came to war, whereas Churchill called the French army the sword and shield of Europe. Well, as we know, it, it wasn't able to last very long. He thought that the war would bankrupt Britain. He thought that we would lose the British Empire. He, he thought that the only gainers would be the Soviet Union and America. Uh, and in that he was correct. He also thought it would be infinitely worse than the First World War, and it was by a factor of uh, five or six fold in terms of the number of deaths. So um, he was accurate in his view, and he would probably think that any the next war, if there was to be one, would be even more lethal and destructive than the one that had gone before. So I suspect he would do everything he could to try, to try uh, and avoid war. Would, would, that would still be his policy. He did change his view very dramatically on Hitler, who he came to absolutely detest, and um, he was a crucial voice in that war cabinet meeting that I mentioned when Halifax was urging uh, mediation from Mussolini to find out Hitler's peace terms. Um, it was Chamberlain who backed up Churchill and said, no way. So to that extent, he certainly did learn. Uh, he knew that you couldn't do a deal with Hitler, it was impossible. I'm just going to take one more question about Ukraine and the parallels, and then um, it'd be quite nice to round off with some more general questions about writing, which are coming in as well. Um, but the, the, the Ukraine parallel from Christopher Clark, who says, coming back to the Ukraine, can you say more about the parallels you, parallels you see between the deal in 1938 on Sudetenland and the arguments being advanced by Putin about the case to bring the Russians in the Ukraine back into the Russian fold? Is that a a real echo? Well, I mean, there are echoes. I felt Crimea was particularly strong echo. I mean, um, you know, the crucial thing about Munich, um, what, I, I mean, if it's the Christopher Clark, the historian, who knows this 10 times better than I do, uh, that, um, you know, the Sudan Germans really wanted to go 
and be part of Germany, just as, as far as we can see, the Austrians also really embraced a return, well, or becoming a part of the greater Germany. Um, and there was, and the territories that were handed over were all more than 50% um, uh, ethnic German, German speakers, who did feel themselves to be a minority, uh, who, were, who were not well treated, um, and Czechoslovakia, you must remember, was uh, unlike the U Ukraine, an, an ancient state. Um, Czechoslovakia was cobbled together in 1919, very much urged on by the French, with a lot of minorities crammed in where they didn't particularly want to be. And if you look at the map, there is no Czechoslovakia now, because the moment it became possible, the Czechs and the Slovaks split up. Uh, so. To a degree, it was a, it was a false. It wasn't a real country, you know. It was a new, newly created country uh, that had bits in, put into it to try and make it e economically viable, and therefore was quite a tricky number to fight a world war on the issue of the Sudeten Germans. And indeed, the British and the French agreed before Munich that even if there was a war, the rest restoring Czechoslovakia's pre-war borders wouldn't be a war aim, that the Sudan Germans would not necessarily be made to go back into Czechoslovakia. So we would have fought the war for nothing, really. It was crazy. I mean, Ukraine, of course, we, 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 we know that these areas voted 90%, some of them, even in the East, they voted uh, pretty substantially 55 or 60% to be an independent country. So the parallel is different. Uh, uh, this is an old state uh, that has decided its destiny and wants to do something different. And it isn't, uh, it isn't a, a Russia stampede of Russians, as I understand it, to want to uh, go to Moscow. Um, final question about history before we ask you what you're up to at the moment. Uh, Nick Rugg, a question, uh, your 1988 TV documentary about Munich. He says it contains some excellent first-hand recollections can you still see it? Is it available anywhere? No, it's not, unfortunately. And given that the BBC put so much stuff up on YouTube or on iPlayer, it would be nice if they would do it. I mean, it's a pretty, uh, it makes me squirm because I, you know, I was 30 years or more younger. Um, I looked like a child wandering around. Uh, but there are some great people in it. Alec Douglas Hume in particular, uh, Neville Chamberlain's um, daughter uh, is in it, and uh, it is, uh, it's, I mean, it's, I think it is still worth w watching, uh, it seems to me. Uh, I think it doesn't stress the German side of the thing as much as the novel does, which I think is a mistake. But, you know, I, I mean, I would, it would be great if people would see it. Christopher Clark tells us he is not Christopher Clark. In, <laughs> he, um, okay. not, he's, he's got it's an not E. An un, not an uncommon name. Uh, that's Clark. right, he's got Sorry, an E. I thought, I thought you might Clark be. Is, yeah. <laughs> okay, um, so we'll talk a bit about writing now. And Carolyn Spring says, what is your daily routine for writing and do you have any specific rituals? Um, yes, yeah, so, uh, I'm a mornings person, so uh, I get it. I'm always at my desk by eight o'clock, uh, and I always finish normally at about twelve thirty, and that's about it. Uh, you know, and I try to not rise from the desk until I've written eight hundred words, uh, which I might revise either a bit in the afternoon or look at the next morning. And my way into starting writing again is to go over what I've just done. Uh, I keep a I keep a kind of um, uh, daily record, uh, which uh, uh, you can see here, because I'm writing a novel at the moment, of how many words a day I've written. And, uh, uh, I, I, you know, it, I, it forces me to keep on going. Um, I'd, I'd like to try and write a novel between in six months, b between January and June, uh, because I need the deadline. And also because I was an old journalist and I need, as you know, Rogers, we do, we need the uh, adrenaline. And I'm a believer in adrenaline because it forces you to see things you, you wouldn't otherwise. You know, you get panicky. I think it was Marshall Joff who said, fear is our great tutor. Um, and, uh, you know, it's true. So 
that's the way that I tend to work. And if I'm doing a book a year, which I like to do if I can, then I have something vaguely in mind when I finish in June that I might do next. And I start thinking about that whilst the public, the pro publication process goes on. Um, I play an awful lot of solitaire, I must say, when I'm try trying to uh, write. Um, uh, but yeah, no, they chiefly that's my, that's what I do. Um, I mean, Munich was written in six months. It was written in exactly this way. I, Conclave came out in September and uh, I started work in January on, on Munich and had it finished by June. Now, we also know not to believe everything we read in the media, but it's alleged that the new book is going to be about Charles I and the regicides. Yes, it's a, it's a novel about uh, two particular regicides, a father-in-law and son-in-law who went on the run in uh, America uh, and were on the run for 15 years. And I've invented a man who's determined to hunt them down. I found the English Civil War fascinating, and uh, but very difficult. It's a really tricky subject for fiction because uh, the issues are so complicated, the religion and uh, uh, power and all the rest of it. And the, and the, uh, it's, it's, the story is complicated. Um, but this tale of a chase um, seems to me to be a way of sort of bringing it alive. And also I've been startled by the extent of the links between the Puritans and the most people probably know this who know the period, but the the communities in uh, New England and the and the Cromwellians uh, and the protection that they offered to these two men um, and the impossibility of managing of trying to get hold of them. So that's what that's what it's about. It's it's named after the legislation under which they were uh, to be tried for treason, which was called the Act of Oblivion. So that's the title of the novel. And I hope to have it done and out at the beginning of September. And of course, we, we love and admire also in alumni, but when you look at your range of books, um, it's an extraordinary historical range. So right back to Roman times for the trilogy and for Pompeii, um, up to date now, some novels which are looking into the future, um, some of them like Second Sleep, which seem to manage to mix both those things. I mean, are you consciously sometimes pushing the boundaries as far as you can go? Or, or, or do you just think, I write about what interests me? I, I write about what interests me. I quite like um, varying... Uh, I like writing books in the first person. Um, uh, but you, you can't always do that quite often. You can't. An officer and a spy is written in the present tense, actually, because I wanted to give the kind of impression of sort of French, you know, how much the present tense is often used and uh and some of them you know that so yes and i use different periods and that's simply because um it's i find it enjoyable to try and move into different periods sometimes i wish that i'd invented a kind of character an inspector rebus or a meg ray or whoever a george smiley that i could just keep going back to um um, and maybe in my old age, I'll try and do that. But for now, um, you know, I just go where my uh, interest takes me. And um, it's been great fun. And I've been very lucky that readers have gone along with me. Uh, the, the big book breakthrough book for me in a May was, was Pompeii, because up to that point, I'd written Fatherland and Ingmar and Archangel and was very much that sort of territory. And then suddenly to write a novel set in 79 AD was uh, was a great gamble, but um, it, it worked. And once I'd done that, then I knew that I could probably uh, hope to, to write about anything, really. We have one plea to note, which is that uh, somebody is claiming that Munich is out of print in hardback and the font size in the paperback is very small. So we can pass it on to your publisher. Um, Helen Metcalf, um, yeah. noting what you said about writing between January and June, asks, when then do you do the research? Well, that it, it depends. I mean, some books, this one, I couldn't have researched in six months. I mean, you know, it's it's a massive undertaking. Uh, others, Conclave was easy to research um, uh, because, you know, it's a limited time period. I had to invent a whole college of cardinals, but that was just fun, really. Um, Munich, I, I'd already done a lot of the research. 
Um, an officer and a spy was strange because almost everything that I wanted was suddenly came online, including the secret dossier that was used to convict Dreyfus. It was suddenly put online by the French government. So I think that, you know, I, I have joined in a lot of criticism of the internet and the social media and so on, but for historical novelists or for novels that require a lot of research, uh, it's been transformative. Uh, it's made it possible to do things that you couldn't have done before. Google Earth, um, to travel to places, you know, walk along in the streets without actually having to go there. Uh, the, the amount of material, newspapers, magazines, everything that's online. I go through the London Library and uh, can, can look at any periodical. I mean, it is absolutely staggering. And there's no way I could have written the number of novels that I had if it, if it weren't for the, for the tools now that we have through the internet. I think we'll take a final question from David Denton who says, what do you read for relaxation? I read, uh, I have a mild obsession with journals and diaries and letters. Um, I like them because they like reading historical documents without any filter, without historian or biographer filtering uh, the facts. Uh, and also the people, the person that is writing doesn't know what's going to happen to them. And there's something about that which chimes with the kind of books that I write, both the documents and the sense of not having hindsight, you know. And the, the, the one that I really can't recommend too highly and has been very in my head for the last two months is uh, Patricia Highsmith's uh, diaries, who writes very, very interestingly about, uh, well, partly about lesbianism and in in, in what it was like in the 40s and 50s and, and so on, uh, and being a woman and making her way as a writer. But she writes brilliantly about the process of writing and the difficulties uh, of it. And, and it, as a portrayal of the writer's life, I, it's almost, uh, uh, I mean, I, I can't think of anything that's better, actually. So that's the sort of thing that I write. I read. Uh, I don't read as much fiction as I used to, actually. I think partly because I just, it's so much the day job um, that I quite like to escape into something else. Well, it's a good note to end, Robert, and thank you for a fascinating 55 minutes, which has just flown by. So we really appreciate your time tonight. And thanks so much for your connection with Selwyn being so strong. And um, I would just say to everyone who's joined us tonight, that, um, do keep an eye on our website and social media for all the latest news from Selwyn. Um, if you look at Facebook or Instagram or Twitter uh, this afternoon, you'll see we've um, just taken over the old library. It's come back into our possession, as it were, from the contractors. So that's good. Uh, there's an announcement this week about our new chaplain. So if you want to find out who she is, and there is a clue there, uh, that's also on uh, the website, in fact, if you have a look at that. And um, if you fancy being bursar of Selwyn, applications close next Tuesday. That's also currently on the website and on the social media account. So that's my plug for continuing news and information from Selwyn. But um, I see, Robert, a whole host of people thanking you again. So Sarah Stamford, former Selwyn librarian, thank you so much. That was fascinating. Um, Helen Metcalf, thank you. Another great session. Kevin Brown, thank you, Robert and Roger. Andy Malone, thanks for another interesting, absorbing session. David Denton, great talk. Raf Santana, thanks so much. Goes on. So um, thank you, everybody, for joining us. Thank you again, Robert. Thank you, Roger. It was great to talk to you. And thanks to everybody who uh, listened, watched and sent in a question. OK, well, th thanks again. Still more coming. Charlotte Woodford, who's uh, our um, uh, German tutor and probably knows something about Munich. Thank you very much. That was really fascinating. Robert Pinsker, thank you very much. Um, Nick Brooking, excellent. Thank you. It goes on. So thanks, everybody. Thanks, Robert. And uh, we'll see you again soon. Thanks a lot. Yeah, Bye. absolutely. Take care. Bye.